السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We thank him for everything that he has blessed us with We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household and all his companions we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all and to bless every single one of us to bless the ummah and to bless our offspring those to come up to qiyamah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness brothers and sisters this evening we are going to be speaking about a very great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was the first from amongst the muhajireen or from amongst the children of the Muhajireen to be born in Medina Munawwara. When the Muhajireen had made Hijra to Medina Munawwara, none of the women were giving birth or had given birth. So a rumor had spread that there was some magic that was done by the Jewish people so that the Muhajireen do not have offspring. And obviously that was false. If we look at today, when certain things do not happen the way we want it to happen, immediately the weak from amongst us begin to blame black magic and they start saying this one did this and that one did that and nine times out of ten it is a lie. So the same applies at that time. There were some people, even some of the non-Muslims had started a rumor to say that there is magic that was done so that these people do not have children. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us a lesson. Wallahi, I was weeping when I was thinking of the number of people who complained to me of how much magic this one has done and that one has done and that's why we're not getting children and that's why for example our marriage is breaking and I know for a fact that that is actually a lie Allahu Akbar we blame innocent people anyway the daughter of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an by the name of Asma binti Abi Bakr she had given birth and her husband was a Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiyallahu an. If you recall, we spoke about him from amongst the ten, a Zubair ibn al-Awwam ibn Khuwaylid radiyallahu an. The reason why we say ibn Khuwaylid, the child who was born, he was related to Khadija binti Khuwaylid radiyallahu anha being the aunt of his father. So as Zubair ibn al-Awwam ibn Khuwaylid was the nephew of Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha making her the grandmother of this child who was just born in Medina Munawwara just after the Hijrah. So as he was born they took him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as did a lot of people at the time and because he was the first from amongst the Muhajireen there was a great happiness and joy because people now knew that all the tales and rumors of magic were actually false subhanallah and so the prophet sallallahu told the father that i will name the child with the name of his grandfather so if you search for who is the grandfather on one side you find that we have al awwam so his name is not al awwam there was the grandfather on the other side asma binti abi bakr so the, the grandfather, the mother's father was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. Why then did they name him Abdullah? I think we would know. Because Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, whose name was actually Abdullah ibn Uthman. We spoke about it when we spoke about him, the first of our heroes, the best of those to tread the earth after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. So he was given a name, Abdullah. And he was also called Abu Bakr. Subhanallah, Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu an, he was also known as Abu Bakr. That was one of his kuna, the kunya, which means the, the pen name they gave him, one of those names was also Abu Bakr. So he was named Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam. Do you want to know how closely related he was to the top brass from amongst the Muslimin? We've already said his grandmother or the aunt of his father was Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. On the other hand, if you look at Al-Awwam, 
he was married to Safiya binti Abdul Muttalib the aunt of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so he was related to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that way as well subhanallah and on one hand he's related to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu being the grandfather and then he's related to Aisha radiyallahu anha being the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his real aunt his mother's real sister subhanallah this is Abdullah ibn Zubair radiyallahu an and do you want to know how he was related to Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu an he had a wife known as Aisha binti Uthman ibn Affan later on in his life he married the daughter of Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu an so he was connected there as well and the cherry on the cake he was connected to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu he married the granddaughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib her name was Nafisa bint al-Hasan ibn Ali radiyallahu an subhanallah look at how closely related he was to all these people may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us closeness to them in the akhirah and may Allah unite us with them in Jannah Amin. my brothers and sisters what a great man and we look at how he was born just after the hijrah some say the year of hijrah some say the following year so either year number one or year number two of hijrah but he was the first from amongst the children of the muhajirin to be born in Medina Munawwara. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless us as well. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did his tahniq. Tahniq, we spoke about it twice before already in this series, where a little piece of date is chewed by someone who is worth uh, chewing it in terms of character and spirituality. And then it is placed in the mouth or upon the palate of a little newborn with the idea of benefiting the child both physically by high iron and so on and at the same time benefiting them spiritually where it is said that inshallah they will inherit some of the good habits of the one who has done that technique so his technique was done by muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and at the same time the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told his father who was oh sorry his grandfather who was abu bakr as-siddiq radiallahu an the grandfather from the mother's side to do the adhan so the sunnah is as, as a child is born the first major sound that the child hears as a muslim should be the call to prayer the call to success the declaration of faith and this is why the adhan is called to this day in the ears of the children of the muslimin who are born myself and yourselves as well as our own children may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us realize the importance of this quick note do not delay and wait for someone to come from far away to do the adhan you as a father or whoever is there present call out the adhan as the first sound that comes into the ears of this particular child may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to fulfill this then subhanallah this man as he grew up he was a very young boy still seven years old and amongst the group of boys they were told because they were born in islam they were told why don't you go and pledge your allegiance to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the others had accepted islam at the hands of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that was their allegiance so the little boys they went up to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam a group of them and they said we have come to pledge allegiance to you and it was such a cute sight subhanallah where you have little children coming and they're like adults to pledge allegiance so muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam chose to hold their hands and take the declaration from them that we pledge that we will follow Allah and his messenger and so on we will not sin we will not do this and that the allegiance that was pledged to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu says I remember it right up to the end of my life I remember this subhanallah when he was much older he says I still recall the day we were young and we went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pledging and he actually took it from us as young as we were the narration say they were only seven years old subhanallah as soon as they had understanding they went and they did this pledge this great young man as he grew up he was known for his salah one of the most powerful things his prayer they say when abdullah ibn umar started his salah nothing distracted him not at all when he would go down in ruku' bowing position he took so long that the bird would come and sit on his head or his back and it would be there for a while without any movement of this man that was the khushu subhanallah and this is recorded in many of the books of history 
that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was such that the birds used to come and sit on his back when he was in Ruku'ah with us subhanallah we barely say one subhana rabbi al azim and we bounce up as though there is a spring somewhere down there that is pushing our head back may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who learn a lesson from this great man when he went back into sujood he took so much of time that people sometimes walked past and they thought perhaps this is just a pile of clothing that is here not realizing there's a human being there in sujood from such a while may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not from those who peck like a little chicken when it comes to salah and sujood this is your rab this is your maker so this was the man he was also very well known for his bravery Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu an. He was well known for maintaining family ties. He had aunts who were the heroes of the Muslimin, the heroines from amongst the Muslimat, those who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aisha radiallahu anha. She was an aunt. She was a mahram, meaning a very close relate, you know, relation to this man. And he constantly used to ask about them. He used to visit them. He used to make sure he fulfills their rights. So we learn a lesson from this. My brothers and sisters, we have been asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill family ties. Sometimes we do not even know who our relatives are. How then will we be able to fulfill those relations? So the first step, find out who your relatives are. Second step, whether they are poor or rich, whether you need something from them or not, Make sure you fulfill their rights for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make it easy for us. He was a man who did not take part in the battles at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was underage. He was still a child. He was a few years old. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, he was 9, 10 years old. Subhanallah. And this is something that makes it clear why he did not take part in these wars. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a lot of dua for this young boy. He was related to him in many ways and related to those who were related to him as well in so many ways and related to his father-in-law Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu in so many ways and his wife and we've mentioned it already. Subhanallah. So at the time of Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu who was his grandfather Something unique is made mention of. He was a small version of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. When you look at Abdullah ibn Zubair, you would see Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. They looked alike. So much in similarity. One was much younger, the other was older. So later on in the life of Abdullah ibn Zubair, we will learn how he became known as Amirul Mu'mineen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us unity amongst the ummah. We will learn what happened in a few moments inshallah. So, he took part in the battles, he took part in the conquest of Africa, he took part in the conquest of Constantinople as well as Andalus going in towards Europe and Spain as a young man and he was a very brave man. But something happened at the time of Yazid ibn Muawiyah radiallahu an. When Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhu passed away, his son Yazid took over. And he sent to all the people to pledge allegiance. I am now the new Amir. And people were quite upset. The reason why they were upset is because Yazid ibn Muawiyah was not known for good qualities. We will not go into details of what exactly they blamed him for. But they said he's not fit to be our leader. And his father just said when I die, my son will take over. So he did not look at merit. So a lot of people came to Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu who was one of those who refused to pledge allegiance to a man whom he said is not fit to lead the whole nation. So a lot of people said, Oh Abdullah, you take the reins. So initially he refused, but people pledged allegiance to him from so many different parts of the Muslim lands. If I can name them, the whole of Hijaz and Yemen and Basra and Kufa and Khurasan and at one stage the whole of Asham besides Damascus they said Abdullah ibn Zubair is our Amir and he is the Khalifa so from the year 64 Hijra right up to the year when he was killed 73 Hijra Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam ibn Khuwailid radiallahu an was known as Amirul Mu'mineen and this is why in some of the books they talk of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu an they talk of Yazid ibn Muawiyah and then they speak of Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam ibn Khuwailid radiallahu an being those who were the Khalifas and who took over the uh, Khalifat of the Muslimin however ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi is the one or one of those who confirms this 
Ibn al-Athir, rahimahullah, is one of them who confirms this. At-Tabari in his tafsir also confirms this. And so many other historians. But it was a major time of trial amongst the Muslim ummah. And we know there was a dispute. We have made mention of it and as we have learnt with us, those who were companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We still offer them the honor of radiyallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. No matter what happened between them, they were better than myself and yourselves. We have no right to be judges. For that, Allah has appointed a whole day. Maliki yawmiddin. We read it so many times. He is the owner of the day of judgment, which means he is the judge. He will judge. Let him do the judging. Like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, one of the Khalifs who was a very noble man, a pious man at the head of the century. He says that perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant Jannah to the one and forgive the other one and still grant him Jannah. So who are we to talk about them? Subhanallah. So this man, Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu an, he was one of those who was based in Makkah al -Mukarrama. And for the moment that he was considered the Khalifa, the base of the Muslim nation was actually Makkah al -Mukarrama. And what happened? He remembered that the Prophet ﷺ once said that Quraysh wanted to build the Kaaba according to the building of Ibrahim salam, which means it was round on one side and square on the other. And so whoever would like to do that at some stage would not be wrong. So Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu, he decided to build or rebuild the Kaaba according to the plan of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the initial structure. What happened is Quraysh wanted to build it that way, but they did not have enough halal funding. They only wanted to use halal funding to build the house of Allah, even though they were mushriks. But they knew what was wrong. And they knew when they usurped wealth and so on, you cannot use this for a good cause. May Allah help us all. May Allah make our income inshallah pure i mean so as zubair ibn al-awwam or abdullah ibn zubair ibn al-awwam radiallahu anhu later on decided to build it such that what we know as the hijr ismail today the little semicircular portion was taken into the kaaba but in order to get that done it was a major issue he got 50 from amongst the senior men at his time to bear witness and to be there when the foundation was dug to see that look this is the original foundation they found it and they built on it and he lifted it slightly higher than it was at the time right up to the height that it is today but later on there was a man who came to attack Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu an and he was sent by the Amawiyin Abdul Malik ibn Marwan may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and forgive them all and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson that the infighting between the Muslimin sometimes is more dangerous than the others who are fighting us from outside. Remember this. So protect your deen and protect your brotherhood. Brothers and sisters, we can have differences of opinion. It must never make us lift a finger or a hand against the other. We are brothers and sisters. We declare the Shahada. Remember this. It is something that has caused bleeding from the beginning and it is causing bleeding today because from amongst us there are those who think that difference of opinion is disallowed disallowed which means i am the only one on earth who is right the rest of them need the sword if that is the case we have learned nothing from the battles that took place where our own leaders were lost on both sides were good people but the devil was bad remember this people are sometimes good but shaitan makes them fight and quarrel. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us a lesson. So this is Abdullah ibn Zubair. He was faced with Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi The name of a man who has spilt the blood of so many of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and those who followed. And he spilt the blood with the instruction of those who were above him at times and sometimes without their instruction. So what he did is he surrounded Makkah al mukarrama and something known as a manjaniq. Manjaniq is similar to a cannon which they had lit up a whole uh, ball of fire made with stone and so on and they would literally catapult it into Makkah al mukarrama So much so that Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi was one of those 
who damaged the Kaaba and burnt it by mistake, so to speak. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So what happened is they surrounded Mecca for a long period of time and Amirul Mu'mineen or the one who was the Khalifa at the time, Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam ibn Khuwaylid radiallahu an, there were a lot of people from amongst his followers who were being affected by it and it ended in the fact that the, the, these people walked into Mecca and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us, they executed this man in Mecca, in the Haram. May Allah forgive us, may he grant us all a lesson. Wallahi, it's a very sad story. His mother, Asma binti Abi Bakr radiallahu anha was alive. And Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, after having crucified this man, and, and subhanallah, he mutilated the body of this man. He comes to Asma binti Abi Bakr radiallahu anha and says, Oh, the mother, you are the mother of such a great man. You've just executed the man. The Khalifa Abdul Malik ibn Marwan has told me that I must take good care of you and I must ensure that you are comfortable. So is there anything we can do for you? Oh, my mother. She says, please don't ever address me as my mother. I'm not your mother. Subhanallah. And number two, we want nothing from you. Remember what you've done. You have spilled the blood of innocent people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them and us all. So this was how Abdul, uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam was killed. Although he was such a brilliant man, like we say, he was known for his salah. On top of that, he was known for his fasting. He fasted almost every other day. He was a man who was fasting and he was known for his bravery. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them all and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Very important note is never mess your tongue speaking bad about any of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like we say, if there was a dispute among some of them later on, leave it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not mere dirty people like myself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We have no right to speak about such clean people whom Allah alone knows. Perhaps they will be from amongst Jannah. One will be forgiven and the one who was right will be in Jannah anyway. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. The next hero we will be speaking about. Someone totally different. His name was Abbad ibn Bishr radiyallahu an Al-Ashhaliyu Al-Ansariyu Al-Badri. He was from Bani Al-Ashhal in Medina Munawwara, known as from amongst the Ansar. And he was a man who accepted Islam very early. And he was known as Al-Badri because he took part in the Battle of Badr. So how did he accept Islam? The hero, Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu an, who was sent to Medina Munawwara to teach them Quran and to teach them Islam just prior to the Hijrah. So, Abbad ibn Bishr says, I used to hear him read the Quran and wallahi that Quran was so beautiful that I used to lose myself listening to Mus'ab ibn Umayr read the Quran. Subhanallah. I used to lose myself. Anything happening, I wouldn't even know what was happening around me. And I heard the Quran. It was so beautiful. I immediately went to Musab ibn Umair. A few questions asked. And I said, Shahid to Allah ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. I bear witness there is none worthy of worship besides the one who made me Allah and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger and I started learning the Quran and I loved it so much he was known as one of the protectors of the book because he memorized whatever was revealed immediately this man Abbad ibn Bishr radiallahu an so he was known as a person who held the Quran he used to read the Quran often so often that he could be heard sometimes reading it beautifully. But there was something unique about him. He says, I enjoyed more to read the Quran whilst I was in Salah. So I could be praying and I would be reading and I would be concentrating. So I would earn a reward of worship and a reward of tilawa, And at the same time, a reward of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in both ways. Allahu Akbar. So he would start his salah and read in a low voice, but he would beautify his voice. Don't we know Muhammad sallallahu has asked us as well that when you are reading the Quran, beautify your voice. So there is a difference between saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm al That's correct. But if you want to earn a greater reward, 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين سبحان الله سبحان الله may Allah accept it from us wallahi we need to try men and women we need to try to beautify our voice don't worry about people around you becoming this or that subhanallah sometimes people are trying and they think no you know i'm embarrassed wallahi that is the word of allah how can you be embarrassed about the word of allah if you make a mistake someone will correct you inshallah but be happy that you are part of the people whom the book has been given to and you've taken it and accepted it as the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this was Abbad ibn Bishr one day he was reading or oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa heard a beautiful voice read Quran so he paused for a moment he heard it and he asked his wife Aisha radiallahu anha is that not the voice of Abbad ibn Bishr and she said yes it is so he made a dua for him Allahumma ghafir lahu and he was such a man he used to read salah late at night and he used to read it in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu sometimes and sometimes in his home and subhanallah once he was walking out late at night in the darkness Usaid ibn Hudayr radiallahu an and this man Abbad ibn Bishr the worshipper and he, they both had a stick they used to hold a stick sometimes because you know there were serpents sometimes or perhaps a little insect or a small lizard or whatever on the road and sometimes perhaps just to see what there is and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum say a miracle occurred for the two of them. What was the miracle? Usaid ibn Hudayr radiallahu an and Abbad ibn Bishr radiallahu an. As they're walking, their stick was shining the path. It was such a dark night, but from a distance, the Sahaba could see that there are two lights coming, two like lit up sticks that are walking. And as they drew closer, we saw that the two went in different ways and both of them had their path lit yet it was a very dark night later on we found out who they were Abbad ibn Bishr and Usaid ibn Hudayr radiallahu an Allah lit the path for them they were people who took very great pride in the Quran they learnt it and they became known as the people of the Quran subhanallah so this was one of the miracles that occurred in this man's life he was 25 years old when he accepted Islam and he was 45 years old when he was martyred in the battle of Yamama when they went to face Musaylamah al kadhab But before we get to that, something very important to be made mention of. A great man. A great man. The battle of that riqaa took place. And on the way back, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had camped the night in one place. And he said, who is going to be guarding us tonight? So immediately two people got up. Abbad ibn Bishr says myself and Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anh says myself. The two of them got up. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa camped with some of his companions. And who was making sure that the enemy doesn't come? These two men. Abbad ibn Bishr radiallahu anh, Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anh. So Abbad ibn Bishr radiallahu anh, he wanted to start his salah. But he was a man who did not want to be a show off because obviously there is a fine line between you know doing something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and suddenly showing off may Allah protect us all but what happened he tells his friend Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anh, why don't you sleep right now uh, would you like to sleep now or later let's take turns one of us sleep and the other one will guard so Ammar ibn Yasir says okay I'll sleep now and I'll get up later on. He says, excellent. So he went to sleep. When he noticed his friend is now fast asleep, he said, right, now is my time to start my salah and I can start reciting. So he started his salah and he started reading Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf. And as he's reading beautifully, he was so immersed in the recitation, so immersed in it, that one man from amongst the enemies had managed to come near to them and he noticed that the Muslims are all asleep, but someone is standing, which means someone is guarding. So he threw a spear and some narrations say an arrow. The arrow hit Abbad ibn Bishr on his shoulder, but he carried on reading his salah. Subhanallah. And a little while later, he, he took it out and he put it down without even realizing what he was doing. Subhanallah. And then another one hits him and he carried on reading his salah. He didn't even move. And that little enemy is thinking, I wonder what's going on here. Nobody's moving. Have I hit the man or have I not hit him? So a third one comes through and the third one hits him as well. And still Abbad ibn Bishr radiallahu anh is so immersed. And then he notices, hey, something's hit me. 
So he, he pulled this thing out. He went to Rukur. He took his time. When he was in sujood, he tapped his friend because he did not want to end the salah so quickly. He tapped his friend until Ammar ibn Yasir anhu woke up and he noticed blood. And he asks Abad ibn Bishr anhu, Hey, what has happened? So as soon as he completes his salah, he says, No, I was hit by some enemy spears here. I wanted to just draw your attention to the fact that just take a look who there is perhaps. So Ammar ibn Yasir says, May Allah forgive you. Why didn't you wake me up when you, was, when you had the first one? Why didn't you actually wake me up when the first one hit you? He says, Wallahi, oh Ammar, I was in, plugged in with Allah in salah. And I was reading this Surah Al-Kahf. And I was reading verses I did not want to cut this communication between me and Allah. I had such beautiful verses. They had just impacted on me. And I decided I must complete this. I cannot just cut it. Because I want to tell you that I am injured. Why should I say that? Let me continue. Subhanallah. And I was so immersed in this that by the time I noticed what had happened. Subhanallah. I was already completed with that entire surah. Allahu Akbar. Pause for a moment. My brothers and sisters, what type of concentration do we have in Salah? So I asked one of the scholars once in Medina Munawwara to give me a tip. Look, regarding concentration in Salah, we all complain. He told me something very interesting. He says, take out from your mind that which is excess. Because your mind is like a computer. Subhanallah, like a computer. When you have unnecessary things that you have stored, even though you might have a 16 gigabyte space, subhanallah, when you've got a lot, it slows your computer down. It starts and it starts up taking more than the few minutes that it used to when it was brand new because there is so much excess in there, it's sluggish. And sometimes if there's a virus in there, you've had it. Every little while it keeps on popping up, keeps on popping up. So you need to know your body and your mind is similar. When you have unnecessary things, that you've engaged in in life, you will never be able to concentrate in salah. Because as soon as you say Allahu Akbar, this virus keeps on cropping up, everything starts coming, all the unnecessary things. So this is why cut out unnecessary waste of time, you sitting and laughing, watching movies and doing all this. It all comes back to your mind when you are in salah and you start thinking of all these dirty things. May Allah safeguard us. Wallahi, I learned a lesson and I chose to share it with you today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to concentrate in salah. Clear your hard drive, format it, and inshallah you'll be able to see that when you start your salah, it is so quick. You might want to know why I delayed when I started this talk. I paused for a few moments. Same reason, I normally record this talk on my own phone, and today, for some reason, it happened to restart. So I was waiting for it, and it took a bit of a while. May Allah forgive me and forgive us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us, my brothers and sisters. These were our heroes. Even if we take a single lesson from every one of them, Wallahi, we will spend a lifetime full of joy trying to emulate and to follow the goodness that was taught by these people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us go back to the original teachings of the deen in a way that we are calm and collected ourselves. And when others happen to interact with us, they can see the calmness of the trial of following the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah accept it from us I want to mention one more thing subhanallah I've just seen it in my notes here Abad ibn Bishr radiallahu anhu was killed in the battle of Yamama when they went to fight Musaylama al kadhab it is reported in one of the weaker narrations but I'm going to make mention of it for purposes of benefit that he saw a dream the night before he was killed and he narrated it to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu and he told him that I saw a dream last night that the sky opened and I was taken up and then it closed and immediately they looked at each other and they knew that this means you're going to be martyred in this battle that we are having tomorrow and that's exactly what happened in fact the battle was the same day he had seen it in the night the next day although this is a slightly weak narration according to some of the muhaddithin but it's interesting to know that sometimes people do dream and some dreams do come true but with us who are so sinful subhanallah every little dream we get excited about it remember Islam is not based on dreams and not all your dreams are important if there is something 
of importance and you feel it's of great importance then subhanallah you may want to try to get it interpreted by a person of experience who is trustworthy and knowledgeable but don't get too excited with these dreams sometimes some people their entire life is about dreams such every night they get up in the morning and they start compiling i saw this dream it means something relax more important than all that is the message of allah the quran and the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam may allah help us to follow that wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanaka allahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk